Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. My guest today is Boromil Baranowski. He is the author of his latest book called Living Where Others Vacation, which is what we spend most of our times talking about, how he's running his investment firm back in Manhattan from a gorgeous Caribbean island, and how he's traded in his daily commutes on the train for surfing sessions in the, in the beautiful waters of the Caribbean. We had an awesome time talking about how he's converted his team into a remote team amidst the pandemic and really embraced life on the road of, as a digital nomad in more of a traditional business in the financial firms uh, of New York. This is a little bit unheard of, um, but he's revolutionizing that and sharing his journey through his book. And uh, he's just a super interesting guy. He's also a TEDx speaker, written multiple books, co-founder and partner at an investment firm in the city, and just has a ton of information to share about his history growing up in communist Poland and eventually making his way through other European countries and falling in love with New York and uh, just has built an amazing life for himself. He's also a pilot, a sailor, a a scuba diver, and now surfer in uh, the Dominican Republic. So We had a blast catching up. Um, It was the first time that we had met, and it was just really, really great to get the chance to pick his brain and hear how he's converting his team into a remote team and really embracing the, the life of a digital nomad, living where others vacation. And the book's fantastic as well, so hope you'll check it out. Please help me in welcoming Boromil to About Abroad. Bogomil, welcome to About Abroad. It's so great to finally meet you. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. I'm very excited. <laughs> you, you and me both. Uh, I, and I have to admit something here right off the top. So I found myself a little bit nervous for this one. And the reason being is normally I come into these like little peek behind the scenes with very little information. And I don't like do a lot of preparation or create interview questions or show notes or anything. I just I just kind of go into it and see where the conversation goes. But in your case, I'm reading your book right now and I know you too well. So I'm wondering, I'm like, oh, I hope I don't mess this up because I know too much. <laughs> Not at all. I think it will give you a head start with all the questions you might have and the topics we can talk about. So that's, that's very cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, a, a couple things that I thought were really interesting reading your book and, and living where others vacation. It's, it's super fun to read. You, you, you can't help but live vicariously through your, your, uh, your travels. And a couple things that I found super interesting is I found we have a ton of stuff in common. One, we both got married in the Appalachian Mountains, myself there in you North go. Carolina, you in, <laughs> you in Georgia. You're a big Tim Ferriss, four-hour right. work week guy. So am I. Big fan of that. We're both expats <laughs> living in, in foreign countries. And we both know Nacho Rodriguez from, from uh, the That's Canaries. Right. So like, I thought, man, we have so much to yes. talk about already. But <laughs> what, what I was actually hoping we would start with is something that we do not have in common, because I think we're going to come to all that yeah. stuff anyway. Is your, is your history yeah. or the kind of where your life started, in, and you talk about this in your book as well, is in, in communist uh-huh. Poland, and how far you've come from that. And just... So maybe we could just That's start right. there with like your roots and, and maybe how that sort of shaped you and w- what effect that's had on you growing into who you've become today. Well, you know, the, the book talks about all the travel and the last 12 months, uh, the pandemic year that my wife, Megan, and I have had a very unusual time. We left New York, our city life, city comforts, and we drove out of the city, lived in two cabins in the woods for six months and now the last six months in the Caribbean. But in the book, I say that's not how my journey started. Not a New Yorker, not born in the U.S., not American. (laughs) I was actually born in Poland in 1980s at a time when Poland was going for a dark period. It was a 
communist era and there was no travel, huge restrictions, empty stores, lines. Not a fun time to be to be around, but I think it shaped me in a certain way. And the funny thing is that when you're growing up as a kid, you don't know how the rest of the world lives. So I thought that all the kids my age are waiting in line to get a Russian card with their grandpas. And I thought it was you know, event of the month for me so I could spend more time with grandpa and he could tell me stories. I thought all the kids of, of my age are doing the same thing around the world. I didn't know that that's not what the kids are in the US or France or Spain or anywhere else are doing. So as a kid, you don't know. And then you realize, oh, there's a bigger world out there. And in the book, I mentioned that I picked up um, a book with all the countries of the world that my grandparents had. And I was going down the list from A to Z. And I was amazed that there are so many. And I was mesmerized by countries that had two words in the name, Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos. I actually have a good friend who's from Trinidad and Tobago and was reading my list my book, and he says, oh, my, my, my country made it to your book <laughs> even before we met. So I, that, that kind of upbringing made me appreciate little things, it made me appreciate the, the freedoms that you can have that you might not have. And once Poland opened up, we could travel, and my parents love to travel, and, and I give them a huge credit for imparting that kind of curiosity on me. And we had very little budget, but we took our little car and we drove to Greece. And I shared this story in the book, and I was 10 years old. We, we drove to Greece and it was such a cool trip. And I got to see the Greek ruins. I got to swim in a warm sea. Polish Baltic Sea is very cold. <laughs> and and uh, the sea in Greece was very warm. And I had so many memories from that trip. And it really opened up my mind. There's a bigger world to see. And, and the rest of my life was kind of shaped by it. So as soon as I could, I decided to become a foreign exchange student. I went to Brussels. I was hooked. I wanted to go see other countries, live in other countries. I enjoyed meeting all people from all parts of Europe. And I, I didn't speak French at the time, but I found an opportunity to go to Paris to do my graduate degree at Sciences Po in Paris. And I signed up for French courses and I had a big, big motivation to learn another language. And when you have a motivation to do anything, including learning languages, I know you're learning Spanish and I'm learning Spanish while I'm here. So maybe next time we do this interview, I'll be speaking uh, Spanish with Dominican accent and you're going to be speaking with a beautiful Spanish, Spanish accent. <laughs> so we, we, I'll be, I'll be super jealous. <laughs> we might make this a goal maybe for, you know, six months from now or a year. But anyway, so I, I went to, to yeah. Paris and, and Paris was so much fun. And on the way to Paris, I picked up a book that I talk about in my TEDx talk, where I explained that everybody should be an investor. And there was a book up on one up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. And, and I realized what I really want to do, which is investing. And I knew that I have to go to New York. I just made up my mind. And I thought I'll go study in New York. That plan fell through which is, I think, the lesson for me and for everybody else. If your first plan falls through, come up with another one. <laughs> Persistence <laughs> pays off, especially in moments like this. And I went from, oh, there's no hope to, oh, there's an opportunity. And the other opportunity was actually better because I got um, an internship offer in New York a year later. And I moved to New York and I spent 15 years in New York, most of my adult life. And I fell in love with New York, great energy, fun city a lot of fun people and my met my future wife who moved to new york from chicago fell in love in new york uh, with new york in high school and moved for work and we spent many years together in new york walking through central park uh, that was our little commute at some point not all of my commute was that fun but at some point we were walking through central park i enjoyed <laughs> that in the book i wrote, write a lot about commute and my experience with commute that that's my least favorite daily activity one can have <laughs> oh it's just brutal it isn't is, it is like brutal. like what a what a luxury to have gotten rid of that well, <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll get, get to, to that, that but that's 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 definitely true but you know living in new york we eventually had this new dream of spending some time outside of new york it's an amazing city but there's a whole world out there and we we used to travel a lot before covid and we were spending more and more time outside of new york and i could combine it with some work and, and conferences and speaking and other commitments so it was 
remote work in the sense that I still had an office. We still have an office, but we haven't been to that office in a year. But at the time, I was leaving the office and working from you know, on the road, so to speak. And there was one point that I really want to emphasize. We were in Iceland, coming back actually from seeing uh, Nacho, that you mentioned, our good friend. And in I. I knew we'd get to Nacho. Uh, you you can't you can't help but get to Nacho. He's just that kind yeah, of guy. Like we we needed to we needed to get so to Nacho. Nacho Nomad City, Gran Canaria, a global citizen based uh, in, in Gran Canaria. He he's a great connector and knows a lot of fantastic people. And we got to meet him and actually speak at his event. And that's when we met quite a few of remote workers, digital nomads that were kind of giving us an inspiration and idea, the same way I think our story can give an inspiration and idea to a lot of people, how you can redesign your life. So you don't have to be in the office nine to five every day, or some people are nine to nine and more. And on the way back, we were in Iceland. It was the last day of our trip. It was a 30-day trip. I had many stops in Europe. Uh, Megan also spoke at a few events. She's in advertising. And the last day, we got an email from the airline that our flight was delayed by a day because of the weather. And it was a cheap flight with a layover in Iceland. As you know, an expat and traveler, you know that we take advantage of all kinds of deals. This was our deal. We had extra time in Iceland. Now we realized, oh, we have one more day because of this delay. And a lot of people would say, oh, I really wanted to be home. And we looked at each other and we said, well, it's been a month-long trip, but we're not ready to go back. We'd like to keep it going. And this really opened our eyes that I think we're ready for kind of a permanent tra traveler, more nomadic life. And it took us another year and a bit to, to make it happen. And we'll come back to it. But this was a tipping point for us, sitting in a small hotel overlooking a salmon fishing river in the middle of nowhere in Iceland that I think there's a better way to design our life, not around two weeks of vacation, but around maybe two weeks in the office and the rest of the year somewhere else where we really want to be. And we'll come back to it, but that's, that's the last 12 months of us actually realizing that dream in a setting that we didn't expect, a worldwide pandemic, but nonetheless, that, that was the time when we could actually do it. Wow. And so what do you think was holding you back? Like, like you had, you know, this was all, all this that you just said was prior to the pandemic and the, and the pandemic might've been the, sort of the catalyst you know, the, I would call the straw that broke the camel's yeah. back yeah that that catalyst that sort of forced you to make this decision but what at that point you're sitting there in iceland and you're you're starting to contemplate that but it had probably i mean you were seasoned travelers you you've lived in you, you speak other languages you've lived in other countries that was already in you but did, did you just not think yep. that it was within grasp or what, what was the mindset at I that point i think it was it was us and the world, like two things. So on, on one hand, we were building up courage to do it. it. It's different when you go somewhere for a week or two or even a month. And it's different. And you know that as well, picking up and leaving the country that became your home and going somewhere new where you don't speak the language or you, you might not have friends yet, but you will make friends very quickly. I guarantee that. And so we needed the courage. And then the second thing was more of an outside world obstacle. So I'm one of the partners of a boutique investment firm in New York, which we founded four years ago. We left a larger firm. We wanted to have something independent. And part of the building blocks of our future remote freedom was to make this company potentially remote ready. And I actually spoke about it at Natchez conference. One of the, the panels there, I talked about how we build a remote ready company that it's not remote yet. But it could be. Mm. And I'm the, the youngest partner. So I'm, I have to be aware that uh, people who are a little bit older than me are used to doing things in a certain way. And I took my time to, to explain that we can actually work fully remotely. But I think until you actually try it, it's very hard for people to see. And the last 12 months, it's not just us, you and I, but I think the, the hundreds of millions of knowledge workers, office workers, had a chance to see that if they have to, they can actually work fully remotely. And just looking at the video app statistics, it's, it's 500, 600, 700 million people around the world that have worked remotely the last 12 months for different periods of time, some of them full time. So we all saw that we can do so much remotely. And I think I was breaking through that wall and had the 2020 not happen, I think it would have taken a 
bit more time for me to convince my partners, my clients, all the service providers, everyone we work with, to see that I can be equally productive, equally available, if I'm not sitting at a desk in an office in midtown Manhattan. So I think we broke through this invisible wall that I had no control over. I thought that I can slowly find my way over that wall, but I think 2020 just showed us all that we can make things happen. We were able to onboard clients that we haven't met in person that came for referrals in a business that's very you know, built on trust and relationships. And we did it all over Zooms and using all tools that are available these days where I don't have to actually mail forms to be signed. They're all DocuSign, uh, signed remotely. And clients were able to join us you know, through this process despite of what was going on. So we, we actually saw that not only we were able to maintain the business, we were all able to grow the business without any of us seeing each other for 12, 12 months, which I think is you know, pretty <laughs> remarkable. Anytime, first of all, when I saw Nacho and I met so many digital nomads, remote workers in Gran Canaria, I came back all excited and I was sharing with all my friends, listen, we all should be working remotely. And everybody looked at me as if I was crazy. And they said, well, I can't do this remotely. I can't do that remotely. And then there was a whole list of things that can be done remotely. But look, the last 12 months, we have done, not just us, but, <laughs> but everybody else, you know, including, including very old-fashioned professions, you know, legal and accounting. And in our investment field, we have to work with a lot of accountants and lawyers. And they always told me, you know, it, we have to be all in a room passing uh, papers to sign from one to the other. That's the only way to do it. And right. we've done things when people are in multiple states, multiple countries, uh, stuck, not able to travel or choosing not to travel. And we were able to do it. So I think it was a great experiment, a very eye-opening experience. And I think it sped up what I call the greatest upgrade of our lifestyle that we could have imagined that happened in a matter of months instead of in a matter of you know, a decade or two. Yeah, you, I could not agree with you more. And I, I also have found it like perplexing for the longest time, the the resistance to remote work, because I always craved this like i i mean i i'm i'm writing something about this right now like sort of like looking back at the evolution of sort of my like journey from through different phases of of remote work and i was thinking back to like when i was graduating from college and like literally asking companies like yeah th this job sounds great like any chance i could do this from home like could i you know i i want to i would like to travel some and, and i'm thinking like in my mind of course you can because you're just sitting at a laptop yep. and I might as well be doing that from the Dominican Republic where, where Bogomil is right now, but instead you're making me come to, you know, an office and, and sit next to, you know, 40 other people doing the exact same things. And you refer to it in your book as the, as the hamster wheel. Yep. And I, I love that. Uh, I love that analogy because it really just does feel like that. Yep. The commute, the grind, the, the, unproductive hours. I mean, I won't get, I won't go on my soapbox about remote work too much, but I just, I just find it really interesting when I meet somebody like you who was already, you know, you're a business owner, you're a partner in a firm and you, you have seen the productive side of this conversion, not the, not the downsides to it. It's not like overcoming, it's like accessing <laughs> instead. And I think that's really, really interesting to hear from someone in your standpoint. You, you have to think about it this way. So as a company, as a business owner, or as an employer, you want happy employees, right? And if you can allow them to live the life the way they want to live their life, and they still remain productive, it's a win, win, win across the board. The remote work is such a big topic, but it's not just a you know, selfish, my personal benefit, but think of climate, the miles that have not to don't have to be driven. I was reading that the snowy owl decided to have little ones in Central Park for the first time in 130 years because New York is quiet. There are fewer people. Mm -hmm. There's less pollution. So, so the nature is responding. The climate is responding. Now, opportunities. You mentioned you were trying to get a job and then it couldn't be a remote job. I have so many friends that had to quit their jobs because they were moving coast to coast in the U.S. or leaving the country, which I always thought is such a huge loss because you have this talent that works for you and you have to say no just because they can't live within the 
five or 10 or 20 mile radius from your office. How, how silly is that, right? And it makes no sense, it, really. Like, like logically, it makes no sense. And, and, and onboarding and retraining is one of the most expensive. I mean, you know this, but they're one of the most expensive costs that companies can take on. And they readily let people go because they, you know, they have to move a one time zone away or, or, or even less. Well, so it it's kind of reminds me of the story of, of, of two young fish swimming upstream and an older fish swimming down. And, and the older fish asks the younger ones, how's the water today? And the younger ones say, what is he talking about? Because the, the fish are not aware of the water. They grew up in the water. The water mm. is, is part of their uh, life. And I think, you know, we were born into this hamster wheel mentality. When I arrived in New York, I was wearing sneakers to get to the train as fast as possible to shorten my commute. And I was running with everybody else to catch the train on the way back. And I thought, why are we doing this? But that was 15 years ago. Now the technology has changed a lot. And we can do so much remotely. I mean, you are in Spain. I'm in Dominican Republic. And I have clients that are all over the U.S. And some of them are in Europe. And they really don't care where I am physically as long as I get things done and I'm available and I can talk on Zoom. And hopefully once pandemic is gone, I can see them in person somewhere. But as long as you can be productive, it's, it really makes no sense for us to be driving, taking a train to a desk and then sit at a desk and be productive. You're wasting so much attention and energy on just getting back and forth between home and office. And I was reading how the commute that takes up more time than people have for vacation every year. And it's a source of headache, divorces, health issues, family life issues. Why are we doing this? And not even mentioning a climate and everything else. So I hope that we can walk away from 2020 and, and realize that there's a better way of doing this. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people are coming to see the light on that. Um, the environmental issues are are real, and the and and hopefully people are taking this more seriously and seeing this as one of the the more impactful solutions that we can, more tangible solutions that we can uh, apply right away as as individuals. You know, the a- average commute times what forty minutes to an hour, depending on who you ask, exactly. round trip in a day for each individual and. Uh, all the carbon emissions and then just the, the, the balance that you can find in life. And I loved this. And this, this is a great, I think, segue into some of the more more fun stuff about your journey, because we could probably stay on that soapbox for a while. <laughs> but like the the balance that you've managed to find, the different places you've lived over the last year and, and the fact that you're on this beautiful island, you obviously, for, for those of you that haven't read uh, Bogomil's book yet obviously you should and then secondly he like you you immediately find out that he has a a, a love for the Caribbean and so to, to kind of see you transition from New York where you also loved it to this like super laid back but balanced and still uh, productive lifestyle that you're living on this gorgeous tropical island and learning to surf and it's just like it sounds like so idyllic, like, like why wouldn't we embrace this uh, as companies, as bosses, as leaders, individuals? Like, why wouldn't we just as a society say, yeah, this is what we should be doing. Why, why would we not want to hop out of the hamster wheel? Exactly. So, so you mentioned Tim Ferriss for our work week. It's a book that, that somebody recommended to me, a good friend, an Australian friend that actually lived all over, it, which is probably like a lot of people who read the book. And then I read a lot of book about retiring early. You stay in a job you don't like, then you retire early and all kinds of books about different life design. And I was not really finding something that's exactly for me. I liked a lot of the ideas I was finding all around. And I, I read a lot of book about remote work and why it could actually work. And I was not finding a book that's, that's for me. And that's why when the last 12 months happened and we walked away with so many lessons, leaving New York, living in the woods, uh, which we loved, hiking, kayaking, and now living in the Caribbean, surfing, learning Spanish, and you know, staying very productive every single day. I thought that you know, I just want to share this story because we, I saw how many friends are asking us, so how did you do this? Well, how did this work? It must be expensive. And, and you know, how are your bills getting paid? And where do you get your mail? And all kinds of things that I actually talk about quite a bit in the book, how we try to streamline our life so we could exit the life we were living. At the end of each trip, when we were traveling, I was thinking how, what would it take for us to live where others vacation, which became the title of the book, Living Where Others Vacation. 
And I was wondering, can I flip the script? So not spend two weeks trying to, uh, I call it the express relaxation, where you go somewhere for four days, which we did in the past, and you get the, the welcome drink, and, and you go to the beach, and you collapse and fall asleep after a long flight just to get there. And then in, in two, three days, you're doing it. You're coming back and heading back to the office, and you have all the regrets that you left because there are so many emails that you missed and, and meetings that you should have been a part of. And it was actually more stress to be on vacation than to just stay in the office. So I thought, how can we flip the script? So last year, people say that they turned their world upside down. And for many people, it did. And it did for us. We canceled so many trips. We canceled our wedding that happened in Georgia, as you mentioned, and without giving too much away. But it, it was uh, an you know, express planning 10-day wedding that came out much better than we thought. But all this to say, I thought that the last 12 months gave us a chance to maybe turn our life right side up, which for me means living where we want to live most of the year. And if I have to be available in a physical office or in person somewhere for maybe up to two weeks a year. So flipping the script completely. And we'll see how it works in the long run. It has worked very well so far. And I think that's, that's the future. So building your life around the things you want to do, not building your life around work. Although work actually benefits in the process because you're a happier person. The one thing that I like to emphasize that helps, helped us, and, and I write about it quite a bit, quite a bit in the book, is I, I love to, to research and have, have a plan. And you're the to-do list expert, so you can chime in. But <laughs> <laughs> I have lists, and, and I like to know what's going on. And 2020 for me was the, the peak planned and researched here because I had a lot of work commitments. I had speaking engagements on both coasts and I had a trip back to Poland to see my family in March, which didn't happen. And we had our wedding in the middle of it all. And uh, we had some idea of a honeymoon maybe later in 2020. And obviously none of it happened. We canceled all. <laughs> so that was a bad year to have have so many great plans. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> I mean, it, on the bright side, it ended up turning out great for you. I, I know that to be true, but I mean, that must have been quite stressful. It, it was, it was, you know, heartbreaking because we we planned it as as you can imagine, you know, a wedding. You think about it ahead of time. It was supposed to be in the Caribbean with uh, our immediate family flying in. We both sail, and uh, we wanted to make it happen on a sailboat. So it was a whole adventure kind of wedding with um, a photographer coming in from Alabama who actually ended up coming to Georgia to uh, document our wedding on a mountaintop in Georgia. So all those plans were out the window and we had a, a clean slate. You know, it's like a to-do list that you, you just say, you know, erase all <laughs> and you start fresh. <laughs> so when people ask us what's next, I say we are on a no plan plan which is a completely new experience for both of us, Megan and I, we, we love to have a plan, but we realize that we have so much more fun when we have some sort of a direction, obviously, but then the rest kind of falls into place. Even when you read the book, it may seem that we planned it all to the last detail, but it was happening to us as we were going. So we spent a month, the first month of the pandemic in our apartment in the city, we realize it's not that much fun when you can't leave. New Yorkers say that their apartment is their bedroom and the city is their living room. Well, if they tell you you can't use the living room, there's not much. <laughs> <laughs> there's not much to there's do. Not much to do. Now they set up a COVID testing facility right in front of our building, which I think was a, a cue from the universe. Maybe you should think about moving. And on one of our walks, uh, Megan said, "Don't say no." Uh, she said, what if we were to give up our lease, our apartment, and leave? And we didn't really know where we wanted to go. We just wanted to be somewhere where we can be close to nature. We love hiking. We love kayaking. And uh, it kind of started to happen to us quickly. We found movers. We found a cabin in the woods in the Appalachian Mountains up in Pennsylvania along the, the Appalachian Trail. And within a week, we were packed. We bought a used car. And we were on the road. And I, again, I don't want to give too much away, but it got us going. And then all the things started to fall into place, including the second cabin in Georgia, including our wedding. And at some point, doors started to open and we could travel to 
the Caribbean. And then in the Caribbean, you had a lot of, you know, I would call them uh, slight mis mishaps and, and lucky breaks, but we found a, a place to live that works for us. We found a, a surfing school, we picked up surfing and we were able to redesign our life around the opportunities that were available at the time, all with obvious you know, COVID realities that, that are still present even now in April with curfews, restrictions, we were working a lot around all those things, but we were able to make the best of this year. We called it a tasting menu. So we didn't, we, <laughs> we didn't know when, where this year will take us. And we thought, let's try the woods. Let's try uh, Pennsylvania. We've never been to Georgia. I've been to the airport, the airport, but I, I haven't seen more of Georgia. And it's, it's a beautiful part of the country and, and North Carolina, which is more familiar to you. And I'm sure you know the Georgia mountains too beautiful part of the country and we had the best of times uh, we had an inflatable kayak that we folded and we would throw it in the back of the car and we explored some 10 lakes in the area there was no one there it was just a fun time we would our lunch break was a kayak break which is something i can't really do in midtown manhattan so it's been a remarkable makeover of our life but all this to say the fact that you don't have a precise plan about where you're going to go, what will happen, where you're going to live, it's okay. And things will just fall into place as you start moving. The motion is the first thing that you have to have the courage to do, and, and then things will fall into place. And I'm curious about your experience. Did you always have a plan and a to-do list, or I think sometimes uh, the serendipity takes over? What's it been like for you? Yeah, you, I, I, I resonate with so much of what you're saying because um, it's a very similar story, like similar baselines there. We've had like a couple different chapters of having a plan, not having a plan, winging it, uh, regretting winging it, then, you know, kind of winging it. <laughs> and um, and so it's taken us into multiple continents and countries. And and uh, and in the most recent one where we, we had actually gone back to the U.S., after a year, about almost two years, or a little actually a little over two years of kind of digital nomading, traveling full time. Some people might call it slow matting, like spending two or three or up to six months in one place, but really like on the move quite a bit. And we decided we wanted to go back to North Carolina. And we, we had a plan at that point. We had a list. We said, we're going to go back. We're going to rent a place for like three to six months and and then we had sold our home prior to in in North Carolina prior to leaving on that trip and we said we want to we want to have a home again we want to get our stuff out of storage and like you I know we, we had a storage facility mm -hmm. and we said yeah it'd be great to have a home again and then maybe just like you know from there travel I don't know whether it would be six months or nine months or three months but you know travel a good bit out of the year and then you know come back so it, basically go back but f settle down in a, an apartment or something and then buy a home again. And it was sort of like everything, like we, we had offers in on a couple places that fell through lots of some, some kind of funny stories and a little bit frustrating at the time, similar to your year last year. But at the same time, all those things were happening. My wife came across this visa that was available here in Spain mm -hmm. And it it would allow us to stay in Spain for a year. One thing we knew we didn't want to do anymore was we didn't want a visa hop. Mm -hmm. We had gotten tired of of worrying about a visa out uh, being like over and expired and having to get to another country and just the logistics of it. Um, because we were moving around with our dog, our big <laughs> fifty pound Siberian husky, <laughs> that didn't that didn't make that easy a lot of times. So. Anyway, we just said we want to be somewhere where we can have a visa and at least be there for a year. And uh, and Europe was what we really wanted to experience more of. So while all while we, while our list was falling apart right in front of us, we came across this great opportunity and we said, uh, "Yeah, let's let's wing it and let's go to Spain and we'll figure out out from there." And uh, we thought maybe we'd be in Valencia for a month or two or three months or something and then go. But we got here, we loved it, and we we've stayed settled. We've been here for three years now. Wow. So yeah, it's got, it's sort of a combination of the two, right? Like it is that like sort of, we sort of wing it and then you figure it out as you go and it, and it's, and it kind of works itself out. I think what, what is slowed us down, uh, you were asking about what, what 
push you to make the decision or force you to make that leap. I think uh, I have a tendency to overthink and I, I like to, yeah, to me too. see exactly. So I like to see where, how, what will work. And then I think the last 12 months, although I traveled before, have really opened my eyes to, to trusting that things will work out. There are amazing, friendly people wherever you go that will help you out in, in moments where you think that uh, you can't rely on, on your friends or family. And, you know, we had a scooter that broke down. We had car issues. We had all kinds of things happen on the way, which is all in the book. And uh, <laughs> someone always steps in and can help you. You're not by yourself as much as you think you are. And it's incredible. You know, the people are one, wonderful people are all around wherever you go. And that's something I read about and heard about and I saw to some extent, but actually living it and feeling it and seeing it in, in Pennsylvania and Georgia and now in the Dominican Republic, people are willing to welcome you and embrace you in different communities. We, we missed, we, we're kind of habitual once we get to a new place with our daily routine or we're both up and then and I go swimming or surfing and then Megan has her workout and she drives me surfing and we go to a grocery store once a week and we, we missed one week because we bought too many groceries and we didn't need more. And in the store, the, the people that we didn't know, they remember us. They said, oh, what happened? And I thought <laughs> somebody <laughs> is keeping an eye on us and uh, they notice we're not there. <laughs> so when you look around, they're not strangers. They're keeping an eye on you and they, they, they care about you in certain ways. And it, it happened to us multiple times when people notice that we're not there when we're supposed to be there. And they ask, you know, what happened? And I noticed you didn't show up. <laughs> so the world is much more welcoming and warm and friendly than, than, than we think mm -hmm. uh, before leaving. And that's something that we all have to learn through experience and trust it. And uh, wonderful things will happen on the way. And I, I talk about the time perception in the book. So when the days start to look alike, like they did for me when I was uh, living in New York, because uh, you know, the commute looks the same. And, and I talk about it, how people even line up to the same car of the subway in the morning with the same faces, same people. People follow their routines to the step. And I can't tell if it was a Monday or Thursday because I was standing in the same spot they were standing in. And the day looks alike. When, when you travel, when you change your entire environment, you know, you're moving to Spain, I was moving to to DR, every day is different. Everything is fresh. Everything is new. The time slows down. It's more memorable. And our, all the years before we embarked on this adventure, I remember by the trip, trips we've done, places we've gone. And it's, it's funny when you become more remote, your, your time slows down and, and your life becomes richer in the sense that you have more new experiences. And then can be very small experiences, like visiting a new a fruit stand that you don't know it's it's a new adventure like every day is an adventure that's that's what we really appreciated over the last 12 months that even the small things we found a, a veggie speaking of fruit stands there was a fruit and veggie stand in pennsylvania uh, owned by a mennonite family which is a community in the area and it was pre prepared wow. for for covid in a way because they trust their customers so much that they want you just to leave enough cash and pick whatever you want. So there's nobody there <laughs> to watch. So there are prices on all the onions and apples, and then you just leave the cash in a little box and you pick up what you want. And we have pictures with this fruit stand because it was an experience for us leaving Manhattan. You don't see that in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I don't. I don't imagine so. <laughs> so all those little things become. Uh, I call them uh, time markers in a way that, that they help you remember what day of the week it was and you know, what experience you had. And it's, it's, it's just a, a richer experience overall. Once you leave, leave the, the familiar. Oh yeah. I want to talk about the cough. I, I go ahead. Oh yeah, oh. sure. Sure. Well, I was just going to say uh, two, two quick things. One on um, one, I think when the mundane becomes exciting when when going to a fruit stand becomes exciting for me i love going to like central markets one of my favorite things when we when we moved we lived in ecuador for a handful of months and i loved going to the market even though it was like a weird experience actually like the we called her the our, our pig lady like she where we got our <laughs> bacon or our ham she literally just had a giant pig uh 
full, like open and she just reached into the pig and grabbed handfuls of meat and put it in a bag and would give it to you. Wow. It's weird to say this now because I've been vegetarian for several years, but well, um, man, but anyway, <laughs> looking looking back on that, it was really funny. Like I enjoyed going to the market because it was just such a weird experience. And I kept thinking like, this is awesome <laughs> that I enjoy going to go grocery shopping because when I'm driving home from work back home in the US and I'm like, stressed out and just in my same clothes doing the same drive and i'm like oh i gotta swing into the local grocery store like that's a task and like one more thing i have to do that i just really don't want to and that has become fun for me exactly. and that's like that's what life should be about and, and, let, and let's so let's not save it for that's, that's a beautiful yeah thing. let's not save it for retirement you know there's this mentality of no. you know let's save it for for retirement no let's do it now isn't it more fun to do all those things now instead of you know, much, much later on. And I feel like we shouldn't be saving all those small and bigger fun experiences for later. Just, just do them now. Yeah. Yeah. There's not, there's not a lot of reason to delay the, like I, I've, I mean, some of these things are, I know that we're, we're trained a little bit and taught how to do things certain ways. And, and it's been, it's been a successful formula for a lot of people, depending on how you measure success, I guess. But I have, I think there's always been a little piece of me and and maybe it's the same for you where you just like, I, I know something's not right with this. Like I, I I'm like, you know, you're, I'm like 15 questioning, like, but wait, so you wait until you're 65 to do those. Th- but like, what about all those other years? Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> Oh, just working really hard and waiting. Okay. I don't really quite understand. I must be missing something here. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to have to ask you more about Ecuador and we can talk about it offline, but uh, that's one of the places we thought about what's next after DR and or alternating between DR and somewhere else when it's not a good you know, surfing season here. But that's something we can talk about. Where were you in Ecuador, by the way? We stayed in Cuenca, okay, yeah, that's, that's which is the the third biggest city good in the in the. Uh, in the uh, in. Would you recommend? It's beautiful. You, it sounds like you would recommend yeah, it. Yeah, I, I really I really loved it. It was um, after we were there for six months, and it, it the 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 pace of life was super sl- like it got it felt very slow. We were wanting a little more activity after several months, um, but especially at first, I mean, it's just beautiful you know, half a million person city and tucked up in the Andes. Wow. At, uh, I can't remember the elevation, but I mean, just beautiful Andes all around you. And it's a very like, it feels like the downtown feels like a prototypical, like European kind of city with like beautiful cathedral and cobblestone streets. And yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was gorgeous, really nice weather, you know, temperate weather. You're right there on the equator, but you're at high altitude. So yeah, it's, I, I would, I would recommend it definitely for, uh, for several months. Wow. So you're, you're going to laugh, but we went on a whale watching trip here in DR and it's a fun experience and it's not in the book because it happened after the book was done. And on that trip, we met a guy who was the guide, uh, telling us about the whales and he was a British guy and he told us I'm the original digital nomad because he was asking how come we're in DR without a job. I said, no, we have a job. The, the job is not here. <laughs> it's back in the, the job is back in the US. And he says, oh, I know, I know. I'm the original digital nomad. So I was intrigued. He also loves Cuenca. And uh, he said, I was uploading files some 30 years ago or 35 years ago from the UK to Germany because he was working on site for some insurance company and he was moving data and he was responsible for moving data. Now we don't even think about it. We move files all around it. At the time, it was quite an ordeal, and he did some, some kind of an expert <laughs> to move those files around. But he said, I was moving those files between our branches in Germany and the UK, and I was the, the original digital nomad that now, <laughs> now uh, lives between Cuenca, Europe, and DR. So, Wow, yeah. how ideal. That's a that's a sweet setup right there. The original digital nomad on a on a whale watching trip right, right. off the coast of DR. That's yeah, a, so that's an amazing setting for a good story. You're, you're the second endorsement of, uh, of <laughs> Cuenca, so it must be a special place. I thought we could talk briefly yeah. about the cost because I think that's something that stops a lot of people and I think it stopped us. So and and I talk extensively about it. The biggest challenge for us is that we were living in an expensive city. And uh, we realized, and you touched on it, there's a difference between going places and being places. 
So when we think of vacation, it kind of looks expensive because a big portion of a lot of trips to exotic places is the flight and the taxi and the rides and the buses. And it kind of adds up. It just getting there costs a lot of money. And trying to go anywhere from New York, very well connected, lots of flights, but you know, things get expensive. You want to go to multiple places, go scuba diving like we did, and it adds up. So we realized that what costs a lot of money is not just living in an expensive city, where even you know leaving the house to get a coffee, everything costs quite a bit, but going places costs a lot of money. Now, when you transition and you flip the script, as we spoke before, and you are where you want to be, and you, I call it, you know, going places versus being places, the cost shifts because we haven't spent money on a flight in a while because we're here and if part of it is COVID, but part of it is because we, we like where we are, but we're not moving as much. We're not traveling as much. We're enjoying one place at a time much more. That's one thing. Second thing is that you get a completely different rate if you're coming for three days. And I'm sure you, you can relate to that. than if you're you know, renting or buying a place, and, or working out a long-term rental in a vacation destination, whether it's the mountains and you love skiing, or it's the lakes and you love kayaking, or it's the beach and you like surfing or scuba diving or, or sailing. But if you work out a, long, a longer-term lease with someone locally once you arrive, it, it changes the, the math completely. So when we told people, oh, we're now in DR, you know, a lot of people told us, oh, you know, you have to win a lottery to do it. And we said, no, we actually cut our our costs in half through this move <laughs> because and i call it also not living a double life it's so not maintaining a full home back in new york or wherever your home would be and then maintaining another one where you actually want to spend more time but putting everything you have to like you did and like we did put it in storage whatever you can't donate or or sell or get rid of put it in in storage and then travel, it's a, you're a light traveler and move to the place where you want to be, it you know, changes the dynamic completely. You have one cost, one rent or one mortgage, and uh, you, you have a completely different rate per day in terms of cost than when you go on vacation. So it doesn't really cost more in many cases to, to leave the place where you are and go where you want to be. And you can also, you know, we, we were not looking at being the most cost efficient. And I also shared that in the book. I think we have too much storage and we're paying way too much for keeping things that we might never need, which is a whole separate topic of you know, realization of how much you really need to be happy. And it's much less than I thought. <laughs> but uh, we are kind of halfway with you know, optimizing our costs, but we already see a huge benefit from not maintaining a double life and uh, living somewhere instead of just vacationing somewhere because the cost is you know, completely different. It's not as intimidating as anybody would think. If I can give any advice, and, I'm, and that's something you touched on, we were making decisions with COVID in the background. So we wanted to commit to the next spot for three months at a time. And I talk about it in the book that we went places that we didn't know. Well, we knew Pennsylvania. We didn't know the area where we were going. We didn't know Georgia. We didn't know DR as well, especially the, the North Coast where we are. And we, it was kind of a blind commitment. And we were very fortunate to find the, the, light, you know, the right uh, locations and accommodations. If it wasn't COVID and if we had more freedom, flexibility, less concern about health, safety and all that, we would probably go for a week or two check it out, feel it out, see if it works for us. Again, we were very fortunate, but you know, anyone planning and listening to, to us talking, go for a week or two, or may, maybe even a month before you commit for six months. I think that would be very helpful. And then if it's not the town, maybe it's the town over that you like better, or it's a different part of town, or it's a different province in our state, in a, in a country, give yourself a little bit of flexibility, which we uh, chose not to to allow ourselves last year, but it was a peculiar time. But uh, that's something that I would recommend to people, just you know, give yourself a chance to get to know the place and then figure out. Also, once you're there, it's so much easier to meet local people that will uh, help you with accommodation, which we did, you know, the, the, the last apartments we had, we found through people that we met locally, not through any of the, the apps. So that also comes you know, with the benefit yeah. of a, you know, just lower cost, lower price. 
Yeah, yeah. You you touched on so much important practical information for somebody that might be listening and like wondering, you know, okay, what are some steps that I can take to move in in this direction? And like to to recap some of those with some of my thoughts, like uh, the, the, one of the things you said is like that you're kind of, you, it sounds like you have a little bit of regret about, or like, at least like wish you could change now, but I actually think it can be a positive yeah. is that you still kind of have, you, you still have some anchors quote unquote, holding you down in the U S you have your stuff in storage. You have a car back there. Yeah. You, you have certain things that are holding you back and that's okay. Like I, something I've, I, when I talk to people that are like, Hey, you know, they're like, Hey, you know, how can I, how can I do this? How can I make this transition? Like, I'm not really ready to give up. Like, you know, I have antiques or I have like uh, stuff that I like, you know, or I, I really, I have a car. It's got a, you know, I'm not, if I sell it, I'm going to be under the water on it. And, yeah. you know, or I have a home and you know, well, you rent the home, you know, so you can, you can have those things still kind of quote unquote, holding you back and, and transition to a lifestyle like this. You can downsize, you can, cut costs. And, and like you said, like, even for me here in, in Europe, like we have to remember for a a large majority of the people listening to this from North America, like it's an expensive place to live compared to a lot of the world in living here in Spain, even with the exchange rate, which is at the moment really bad. Uh, I, it still costs me much less to live here than it does to live in North Carolina. And here I live in a, in a big, you know, international city with surrounded by culture and quick flights all over Europe and, you know, but things like healthcare and, you you know, college tuition and, (laughs) um, and just the fact that like, you don't need to drive, you know, you use public transportation more, just the cost of housing is these, all these things like you don't paint this. I think like the, the big thing I took away from you is like, don't paint this broad stroke that like, I can't do it because it's too expensive because you will be shocked once you dig into it, how, how much it's actually affordable for you and actually can save you money. Absolutely. And, you know, anywhere you go, there is a range. And even here, I love the the freedom and flexibility, not just going places, but in terms of costs. You know, we're both business owners, Megan and I. She's running her own advertising branding agency uh, on her own. And she's actually hiring people as we speak, which is exciting. And we, we are entrepreneurs, so our income goes up and down. And having that flexibility that we know that we could lower our cost of living for a few months if we have to, with a subtle change to our arrangements, gives us a lot of peace of mind. So I felt that in New York, we didn't have that kind of flexibility. I mean, you can take roommates, but you know, once you're in Manhattan, there's only that low that you can go in terms of your housing. <laughs> unless, unless <Right. laughs> you know, that's a whole other topic. Unless you want to commute two hours, then yes, you can find something cheaper. But this kind of lifestyle gives you freedom, flexibility, option, and and that's a, a huge benefit that gives you peace of mind that you don't have to worry about money as much as you think you have to. Because people think of travel, oh, you know, it costs a lot of money and all those worries. No, it actually gives you a lot of power back to you because you, you have that choice that you can uh, find an alternative, live even cheaper if you have to. And we're not taking full advantage of it as much as a lot of people are. And I'm sure when COVID is gone, it will be more available. But we could hop on the plane and move to a lower cost country, even lower cost if we had to. So that's something that that's worth keeping in mind for anybody that's thinking that money is something that gets in the way. The biggest benefit of it all is that we get to bring our job with us. So when uh, you read books about travel and and long-term travel from 15, 20 years ago, people had to find local jobs. And I think that the future belongs to the idea that you can take the job with you. And if you guys move from Spain to somewhere else, I'm sure you're going to pursue the same careers or maybe even with the same employers. You're not just because you want to move to Ecuador for the next six months, you don't have to give up the job you have. So if you take the job with you, it really opens a whole world of opportunities for you. And you have your income coming from wherever it's coming and you get to live wherever you want to live. It's, I, I call it freedom and flexibility. That's you know, For us, it's a big deal and we love it. Yeah. Yeah, the lo- location independence and and the f- having the freedom and flexibility is I think like a a new form of currency like it's it's going to 
if it's not already, at least in the knowledge worker space, if it's not already uh, moved on from being a perk to a sort of a, a an expectation, I think it will become that um, over time. You know, I've, I've, when I joined Doist, uh, you know, six years ago, it was even then still very rare to find a remote first company, meaning like no offices, no expectation that you work at, at any given, you know, specific time or sp- any specific place, no zero commute ever, you know, that just didn't, there, there's always a, a but or an if. Yeah. And partly because of the advancement of technology, but partly because of, um, you know, a huge reason is because of COVID that's been, you know, pushed forward, like you said, like at least a decade. And, and now it's becoming less of a perk and less of like a, a selling point and more of like, yeah, well, we kind of expect this. And, and that's happening rapidly. I, I want to add to that. So the last 12 months, and we're talking here in April 2021, you know, exactly, well, a little over a year since the pandemic started. And a lot of people were uh, rushed into remote work in all kinds of fields, not by choice, but by necessity. And uh, we talked about how, you know, proved uh, to all of, to a lot of us that it's, it's doable, it's feasible. Now, when I talk to people about their remote experience, a lot of people mix COVID experience with remote work experience. And I, yeah. I'd like to separate the two, because if you can appreciate the benefits that you received from the fact that you don't have to be in the office, you can pick up and go, you can work the way we are working, from you know, a beautiful place that we enjoy and all the the things that bother us which is you know we can't see family we can't see friends as freely as we used to we can't travel and all those you know we can't socialize as easily you know we're in our pods and we have all kinds of you know, things we have to consider if you take all of those things away because they're not part of remote work they have nothing to do with remote work they have all to do with COVID, and then you, you appreciate all the benefits of decoupling your work from a physical location and see the two as completely different, then we can uh, hopefully embrace and appreciate long-term benefits of remote work. I I hope that the last 12 months will not mix the two and leave a bad rap for remote work in the long run. That's, That's my big hope. We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This season is brought to you by my good friends over at Insured Nomads. They're the absolute best in the business when it comes to providing health, travel, and medical insurance for nomads, expats, and really just all forms of world travelers. I know insurance is often something that's overlooked when we're fantasizing about traveling the world, but it's absolutely necessity that we address this because often the policy you have in your home country isn't going to cover you while you're abroad. And it's also a requirement, as a lot of people may not realize, to actually buy private travel or expat insurance, as it's called sometimes, to obtain a visa or even enter certain countries. So fortunately, there are companies like Insured Nomads to help us with this. Not only do they have excellent coverage and great prices, but they're also providing a first-class experience with additional perks and best-in-class technology via their app. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. I can't recommend it enough. Now, this is a company that was built by world travelers for world travelers. So they know what it's like to find yourself in a difficult medical situation abroad, and they want to keep you from having that same bad experience. So the next time you're planning a trip abroad, whether it's for a week or a lifetime, check out Insured Nomads via the link in the show notes. Okay, now back to the episode. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And I, I think it's a common mistake. Like you see, you know, I, I've had plenty of people say, yeah, man, we're remote now. And like, I don't know how you do this. You know, the kids are here, like, you know, jumping on my back while I'm trying to do a zoom call and the dog's barking and there's an Amazon delivery and I'm, I can't get anything done here. And you know, you're like, Oh, oh yeah, no, that's not how it normally is. Like <laughs> I, I normally go to my co-working like every single day and you know, I have like a routine and there's kids are normally at school and you know, it's just, it's just, it's a totally different environment right, right now. Exactly. You know, the, our life is so work centric and, and it's, I don't think it's just the U S experience. I think in Europe, it's, it's also a phenomenon that 
happens that we spend so much time in the office that everybody we know is from work and all the friends we make are from work. And eventually you feel that if you can't be in the office, you give up on all the social interactions you have in life. Now, I love what I do. I, I always say I would do it if, even if I had all the money in the world. I, we are an investment firm. I pick stocks. I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, we manage money for, for families and entrepreneurs. But I, I love the people I work with. We have a small team. Everybody's in, the, in their respective you know, locations around the U.S. I'm in DR. One partner is in Mexico, actually. And uh, at the same time, the last 12 months showed us that you can make a lot of quality friends outside of work. And I think we had a lot more time to build friends around our hobbies and interests. We got into surfing six months ago, and I'm still really bad. I'm, I'm working on it. I feel like my, my Spanish, my, my instructors are Spanish speaking. So my Spanish is improving faster than my surfing. I don't know what that tells you, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're multitasking really well there though. Picking up surfing in Spanish at the same time. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> well, it's a limited vocabulary around the surfboard, but anyways, it's, it's, it's helpful. But what it made us realize is that you can make a lot of friends around your activities and hobbies. So your life is not as work centric. And it just changes the balance and the dynamic in your life. And I think it's, it's healthier. So when people say, I have to go back to my desk in my office to have my social life back, that's a COVID experience. And you can have friends outside of, outside of work and around your hobbies. And you'll have more time for your hobbies because you're not commuting, you know, whatever it is people say, somewhere between 15 to 25 days a year spending commuting. If those days, those hours can be spent on pursuing any other interests you have, you'll make friends around all those interests and you'll have a whole richer life outside of work. I think it's healthier. And I think it's, it's you know, we all want to work for one, you know, we always say, you know, we want to work for one, one company all life. And, but if you leave the company, you leave all your friends behind, which I had to do at some point of my career. And you realize it's so nice to know people, have people, a big support group outside of your work. It, again, you know, in terms of, healthier, happier life. I think it, it's so much better. Totally. Yeah. And you, and I mean, if you think about the concept of like, like I'm not, I'm by no means bashing the, uh, like friends from work not thing at all. at all when I say yeah. this. I, yeah, no, but I mean, I'm, I know you're not saying that either. I'm, I'm saying like when I, what I'm about to say, I don't, I don't want it to come across that way. Um, but like, work is if you if all your friends are at work like your friends have kind of like the pool of friends has kind of been chosen for you right, right? like your your office mates were selected by hr not by yeah. you and like so you've kind of been like here's your pool of people to choose from yeah. and if if as you said like flip the script and like now you have the whole world to choose from like you're going to you're going to actually find that it brings you much deeper more meaningful relationships um, and, and I've, I've not met many people that have not had that experience once they've gone in the, in the more remote direction. Like I, that's like across the board, almost always people, people find their tribe. I think it's fantastic if you like the people you work with. And, you know, I think we're both fortunate enough to have people like that in our life, but there's a whole world out there of very interesting people that you can meet and you, know, you and I, you know, have so many overlapping interests. We're making, I'm making a friend today as we speak, which I'm excited about. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's so much more fun to just have time and opportunity to build a, a richer social life around work. And uh, I think that's the opportunity of remote work rather than something that you should worry about. I wanted to share a quick story with, uh, that that's in the book as well. I gave a TEDx talk in California three years ago, uh, exactly three years ago, I think almost to the day. And I was talking about investing, how everybody should be an investor in their life and benefit from, from a lifelong investing. But after the talk, it's, uh, I had an incredible experience. One of the students in the room came up to me and he said, uh, my biggest worry is that I will be stuck in a dark cubicle commuting for the rest of my life. And, <laughs> and it gave me chills. And, you know, when you give talks, there's this, I call it the two-way street where, and you mentioned it about my book when you're reading it, that you feel that you know me. And after giving a talk, people assume that they know me and I want to get to know them. So I'm always curious what's, what's on your mind. And you create this moment of, you know, trust and, and, and they come up to you and they share stories with you. They're very intimate. 
And I had to pause for a minute and I explained to him and I was way ahead of uh, time, I realize now, but I told him, you know, there's this remote work movement and people work from wherever they want and the world is changing and the old nine to five office based model with cubicles will go away and you're young and I'm hoping that you'll get to see it very soon. And I pointed him in a couple of directions in terms of resources to, to look it up and, and find potentially employers like you were looking for jobs that could be remote. And here we are only three years later and remote model is much more uh, you know, popular. And I'm hoping that he's listening to this conversation, hopefully living in you know, his dream life and working remotely. But uh, hey, you know, your biggest concern so I'm hoping that, that the student that was talking to me after the TEDx is listening to this conversation and he is working remotely and living his dream life. And here we are only three years later and all those opportunities actually became much more broadly available than they were when we had this conversation. But it made me realize if you see a young person and their biggest fear is being stuck in a cubicle, that's a really sad visual to have. And you know, remote work removes that and, you know, living where others vacation creates a whole other opportunity for us to live a life that we want to live. And it doesn't have to be a beach, you know, it could be a city that you love, it could be the mountains, but you don't have to be stuck in a cubicle. Just wanted to share that because that, that conversation really got me thinking at the time and it still comes back to me that you know, as a student, you're, you're full of hope and I'm I'm hoping that you know, remote work is a window of opportunity for all those young minds that want to find a path in their lives. Well, and I think it's going to take a lot of entrepreneurs and, and you know, SMEs like your you know, leaders in SMEs like yourself, who not just the, the tech companies and the startups in that world that adopt this model, which has kind of been the case up until the last year or two, you know, generally kind of speaking, but in more traditional businesses, financial services and accounting and, you know, like, like services where people say, no, you got to be there to shake hands and look a, look a client in the eye, you know, people accepting that this can be done, that there are, pro, there are trade-offs on both sides of the coin, but that there are some very significant pros uh, on an individual basis and on a, um, on a more societal basis. And to, to see more leaders of of small businesses take that on as from more traditional industries and say yeah we can we can do this let's be forward thinking about it you were already thinking about it before the pandemic and it makes me think you know there are other people that had this on their mind as well who are business owners and said and are now saying yeah we can let's let's make it happen let's make it work i'm curious on on that note how you mentioned your uh your older partners and how you were one of the younger or the youngest how have they adapted during this last year? <laughs> I love that question. I, so, so we're four partners. We, we have six, really seven employees right now. And um, the oldest partner, he has been what I call the original remote worker of our team, although he was completely unaware of the fact that he was a remote worker, which actually happens more often than you think. He splits his life between New York, Paris, and Mexico. And for him, already four years ago, we set up Zoom when people didn't know what Zoom was. And we were having conference calls with him while we were you know, either on the road, but sometimes in the office. And we had all the tools in place. We also set up all the systems. We became an independent firm four years ago, Seacard Associates. And we put all the building blocks of services that we need to make them cloud enabled and remote enabled so we can access them from wherever we are because of him and because of us traveling at times. So we, and I talk about it at the Natchez conference three, two and a half years ago, how we were a remote ready company, but not fully remote. We have some of us being remote some of the time. So he was ahead of his time. And I think I had to give him the vocabulary to, to explain that he is already down the road of you know, being a remote worker. And it's, it's, you know, he's in his 70s, and it's fun to see how he embraced the idea. And in the last 12 months, he noticed how we all were able to transition to full remote work and also be you know, productive and efficient. So 
before those conversations kind of were tricky because we didn't have a practice round of being all of us being remote. The last 12 months showed to all of us that not only we can be, but also you know, the two partners in between in ages, they, uh, they love their new lifestyle. They love that they got all those hours back from not commuting. And we have clients that are in different time zones. When somebody wants to have an early call, if I just have to take a shower and get ready for the call, it's a whole different uh, time needed than me getting ready, putting on a suit, taking the train, taking the subway, getting to the office, right? If you want to talk at 7 a.m. my time, I can do this. If you want me to be in the office at 7 a.m., I have to get my day started at you know, 4 a.m., right? So it's it, a lot of those little things made our life actually easier and we can be more available to clients because we don't have to be in the office. So I think the lessons for us will be, you know, this is here to stay and we'll just have to figure out uh, how we optimize our office needs. We do need an address. We are a registered investment advisor. We need an address. So, but I don't think we'll have uh, in the long run the size of an office that we still maintain because it's not, it's relatively small, but it's still, I think, too much for what we need in the long run. Because I don't see any of us being in the office on a regular basis anytime, well, probably ever, to be honest. <laughs> well, ever, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's, that sounds, I mean, it sounds like the building blocks are coming together, though. And um, again, like, it, it, it sort of circles back, like, it connects back to the personal life stuff that we were talking about, where, like, you sometimes, like, not having like you you had the building blocks in place you had the checklist you had the you had some of these things moving forward and then when kind of like shit falls apart you say oh, now we now we've really got to put our minds into this and how are we going to do it and you'll you'll figure it out like you'll land on your feet and um and you guys you guys seem to have like a great uh foundation for for making this the long-term norm um which is awesome yeah i'm, I'm very excited about it to your earlier point, I think in terms of transition from you know, smaller, larger, big companies to remote, I think it will come down to a battle for talent and a lot of you know, future companies. It's not about the buildings or the location or the resources. It's, it's about people. You know, the, the biggest asset and one of the CEOs, we invest in companies. I get to meet a lot of CEOs in some conversations. They say things that are really um, worth a lot. I think they're priceless. And one of the CEOs said uh, to me at some point that his biggest asset leaves the office at five o'clock. Yeah. And, and I thought he gets it. So if that's your biggest asset, it's not the office, it's not the view, it's not the location. It's, it's not the, the fancy furniture. It's the people. And if you have happy talent, that's your biggest asset. And what can you do to make your talent happy? And, and people even say nowadays, after 12 months of this experience with remote work forced on all of us, that they would give up some of the pay just to be able to work remotely. I mean, how powerful is that statement when you think about it? They're willing to give up some of the pay to be able to continue to work remotely because they, they did the math what's valuable to them. And the time that they save and the time they can spend with family, friends, kids, pets, that's much more valuable to them than the, the additional pay, right? So that's, that's very telling. And uh, I don't think it will be you know, forced from the top by any laws or any rules. I think it will be from, from the bottom up. The talent will say, this employer gives me the freedom to live the life I want to live. That's the employer I'll choose. And uh, I think it levels the, the playing field across, you know, it doesn't really matter that if you live in this zip code in Manhattan or you live in beautiful mountains of Georgia or you live where we are now, you will have an equal access to the same opportunities. And it doesn't matter that you are one of the top five tech companies or you're a startup, you will have an equal access to talent because the talent wants to go wherever they will be treated the best. And I think they'll have a huge leverage here negotiating the terms i i mean i can i can say from my standpoint i i have like a couple points of reference on that exact uh topic like first when i was graduating from college and looking at options like i went for what was the most remote friendly-esque type of job that i could possibly find and i want to say the in terms of like income 
it was probably like 60 or 70 percent of what i could have like what i was offered elsewhere but because of the flexibility and that wasn't even like full location independence it was just you don't have to come to an office but one day a week at first and within a couple months never and uh but i still had to you know you talk about this in the book like i still had the commuter thing i still had to be in a geographic range and and i eventually was able to shed that but at the time that was worth you know a 30 essentially a 40 percent pay cut or whatever uh right right away and then when I came to work at Duist, I I was legitimately making 50% less than what I was making before. And that was to get full, like you can live anywhere in the world and work the hours that you want to work. You have complete control over your schedule. And that was what I really wanted. And so I'm a testament to that, like that I, I believe that will, that's what will drive decision-making for, for people more and more. Now, maybe I kind of went to the extreme or whatever there, but that was very important for me. And now I can see in a hiring position in our company, the the talent that walks through the door for all ranges of positions, like you know, uh, like low low entry level positions, but you've got ten years of experience and you're applying anyway because you just want the location independence. I see that every single day, and and so there's you're right, like the the talent will drive this. It, it will come from the from the bottom up, I believe. When I was done with my grad school, I had an interview at a company I won't mention, a job I won't mention, but it was a very well paid internship. And everybody wanted to get that kind of internship. And it probably paid at least twice as much as the actual internship that I ended up accepting. But at the end of the interview, uh, one, I, I was, the interview was multiple people, but one of the last person I was talking to was somebody that was two years young, older than me. But at the time when you're finishing school, anybody that's a year older or two years older than you feels like <laughs> he, he knows everything. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're so much higher up on the ladder than you are. It's, it's amazing. So the, he, he knows I don't. And he, he looked tired, exhausted. His eyes were you know, sunken in and, and face was gray. And he said, this is a horrible job. You're going to hate it. You're not going to make any friends here. You're not going to work weekends and holidays. And you'll learn a lot, but it's, it's awful. And I thought, is he for real? I mean, he's telling me all those things, but he felt that he has to say it because nobody told him that. <laughs> and 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 I I was I walked away shocked. Uh, listen, a few days after they called me and they said you have it, you got it. When can you start? <laughs> and, and and I thought to myself, this is not it. No, this is just not it, and I can't. And I said no, not having anything else. And in a few few days, something else came up that became my New York opportunity. Luckily, but wow. I said no to that opportunity. And, you know, coming, I'm an investment guy, I'm a money guy, but at the same time, I don't think money is everything. And I think work is everything. And I talk about it in the book quite a bit. Once you're done reading Living Where Others Vacation, my book, pick up a wonderful older book called Your Money or Your Life mm. by Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez. It's a book that uh, the goal was to transform our relationship with money of the book. And it gave me a whole new perspective of, the things that I thought I knew instinctively, but it kind of gave me a whole language to understand our relationship with money. So accepting a job that you will that you will hate just for the sake of a slightly higher pay is just not worth it. And take, taking a job that will take the last hour of the day from you, it's just not worth it. We all have to make that choice on our own, but it wasn't worth it to me. It sounds like you had your priorities and money was not the number one priority. And I, I think you will appreciate that book. Yeah. And I, I, I think uh, it's, it's, some, it's a valuable book to read, especially when you're starting off or early in your career, or at, actually at any point, but especially in those early years where you're trying to figure out what's the right direction and you wake up in a hamster wheel uh, that I talk about <laughs> in the book and you don't even know you're in it. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, and it's so, it's, I think it's so powerful to hear this coming from you. Like you, you are, I mean... If, if I don't know you, if I don't read your book and I just rattle off the first two lines about you that, you know, that somebody might say like, oh, who's who's Bogomil? Oh, he's uh, he's a he lives in Manhattan and he's a finance guy, you know, an investor like you th your, your mind immediately goes to like Wall Street and like guy in suit 
working, yeah. you know, 80 hours a week, stressed out. And, yeah. uh, and, and to hear this, to hear somebody that could be that, but has chosen this other lifestyle and is still yeah. not even still, I should, I shouldn't say still, but like, that is the word that comes to mind. It is still so like happy and living a fulfilled life has to be inspiring. Yeah. Like for me as a college student, I also studied, uh, in the finance department, I studied risk management and international business. And wow. that those were the people that I saw, you know, was like, mm -hmm. as my, at a point I, I thought like, maybe I want to go into investment banking, mm -hmm. not because I really wanted to be an investment banker, but because I saw like, like, oh, well, that's where you, that's where you make the money. And that's where you, you know, that's the lifestyle, but that hamster wheel is, I got to jump on the hamster wheel. And I'm, I'm so happy that I didn't. And I'm so happy to hear successful people like yourself hopping off that wheel or, or never having gotten on it and, and sharing that with the rest of the world to say like, it doesn't have to be like that. Well, that's, that's, that's the essence of, of what the book is about. Just giving uh, other people a chance to see that there is another path. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a book that I wish I had in my hands when I was 20. And uh, I feel that that's a book that could inspire a lot of people to see just a different way of, pursuing both you know a successful successful career but also a happy life and it doesn't have to be one at the expense of the other the way we've been made to believe that it has to be uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm very very excited about the you know the book came out a, a month ago or so and you know, i already heard a few interesting thoughts and opinions from all kinds of people and it, it's fun to see i think it was trim it was uh, ranked it as the number one best-selling travel writing book one of the days a lot of people picked it up on some specific day which was fun to see <laughs> and uh, yeah I'm, I'm i'm very excited to to see what kind of conversations it will start it's a way of giving back because i, I read so many books that inspired me and i thought that this is a story i can't keep to myself i have to share it even if it inspires one single person to to, to, to change slightly their direction of their life and everybody has to choose their path but at least knowing that there is another path, I think it's very inspiring. It has been for me. Yeah, I I totally agree. the The four hour work week was one of those books that gave me some of that inspiration early on. I, I think you might have referenced Vagabonding, another book as well yeah. in your book. Yeah. Um, that was as I was reading through your book, I was just taking mental notes. Like, wow, we also have, you know, we, we both like to talk about this and this and this. And I, and that was one of the ones that triggered in my head. Like I, I read that, I believe when I was 16, 17, you know, and, or no, no, sorry. Wow. Yeah. I was, I was, you know, I was somewhere right there between high school and college. And I remember kind of having that on my mind, like, yeah, maybe, maybe there's something else out there. <laughs> So yeah, I think I think books like yours and and some of the predecessors to yours that touch on this, uh, I guess, alternative lifestyle. I don't know if that's the right phrase, but just showing you how you can live a you know live within. You don't you don't have to be like a, a dirty hippie that uh, you know hops on trains and sleeps under bridges to to live in different places around the world, especially these days. It's it's uh, it's exactly. more accessible than ever. Exactly. Well, you know, I wanted to show a path. I, I talk about it in the book how, you know, my, my thing, my backpacking days are behind me. I, I spent a lot of time in hostels around Europe and I've yeah. done it. And at this point of my life, I'd like to have a you know, fairly comfortable apartment to live in where I have good Wi-Fi yeah. and I can get my work done. But I have all the other benefits, you know, being able to run out and go surfing at any time of the day when the surf is good. We that, share this in common as well, Bogomil. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I also like that's that's super important to me. I'm I got tired. Like I mentioned the visa hopping thing, we were tired of that. But like before we got tired yeah. of that, we got tired of moving all the time and yeah. sleeping in uncomfortable yeah. beds. And you know that was fun at one stage, but it's it's not at this stage. And uh, but you still want a sense of adventure and and excitement, and you want those mundane things to become fun still. And and yeah. so this is the new way of seeking that out. Absolutely. I know I have to let you get back to, uh, to work. And so I've, I've, <laughs> or uh, surfing <laughs> or surfing. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully the latter. Um, but I, if you have a few more minutes, I'd love to just ask you a couple quick questions because there was a ton that I wanted to get to. And I, and I, like I figured we wouldn't have time to cram it all in Tell today, me. but mm -hmm. so first of all, one of the things we'd like to cover on the show is like visa type stuff. So as just as an American, generally speaking, 
what is your ability to arrive to the Dominican Republic and, and how long can you stay? So uh, when we were in the U.S., it was easy, right? State to state, it, it was relatively easy. And we didn't stay in any of the states more than six months to become residents. But here, uh, there are multiple options with uh, different kinds of residency, depending on if you make an investment, if you have a job, or if you, uh, they call it, you have independent resources. So you basically um, can sustain yourself. So there are different paths. And then uh, they also have a path that they call an overstay option. So if you can, you can stay here 30 days. If you stay more than 30 days, there's an overstay option, which may be subject to change. But right now they allow you to stay. I'm not going to say unlimited time, but, but more than 30 days and you pay a fee for the amount of time that you stay. So that's an option when you're making up your mind, if you want to stay here longer term. And one of the residency paths, it's for people that want to stay here longer term, multiple years. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are options. Now, uh, that's something that everybody has to consider. As you mentioned, any country you, you choose, what's the visa situation, how long they allow you to stay, how the days are counted, and what are the, what are the paths for you to stay longer. I'm very hopeful that uh, you know, within months or years, and already now, there are some 20 countries that are offering remote visas. Right. And uh, I think there will be just more options and you know, Dominican Republic is very welcoming. They they want people to come, and I think they'll come up with something that's even more straightforward for specific, you know, specifically for remote workers. They don't have it yet, but multiple islands in the Caribbean uh, have it already. So it's just a matter of time when they have something that's specific for remote workers that bring the job with them, but to, just want to stay on the island. Yeah, I'm I'm super interested. I'm hoping to dive into more uh, more of those visa options that are coming available and talk with some people who have who are taking advantage of it. I've got some little uh, forecasting or foreshadowing here. I've got a couple people lined up to to talk about some of this, but not about the Dominican Republic. Like you said, it doesn't exist there yet, but I could definitely foresee it happening there, which would be awesome. Um, so, but you, to correct to say, you didn't have to get any special visa to go there. You just, you show up, yeah. you can stay 30 days and then you're paying a fee to, beyond to stay that. longer. Yeah. 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 And, and, and without any exact numbers, like it's not like a fortune, right? It's, it's no, affordable. no, it's, it's, uh, I think it's about $60 for six months, oh, okay. a little, <laughs> around a, about a hundred for a, for a year. No, it's, it's not large amounts. Wow. Okay. I, I think the, the fees for some of the islands, I think Antigua, it's an island uh, we also like where we wanted to get married. They offered a remote visa soon after we decided to come here. And Antigua was one of the islands we considered because we know it better. Well, we know Ant DR now better than Antigua after six months, but uh, at the time. But Barbados, we have friends that are in Barbados on a 12-month remote visa. So I know that there are more and more options. And I think it's uh, the islands watch each other and it's, it would be silly not to jump on this train because having remote workers, you, know, you have people that come spend money and they bring their job with them. I mean, what else can you ask for, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a dream come true for an island that's a, you know, a vacation destination living where others vacation that should be their motto <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i mean come come live the dream life you you fly here once every five years and spend a week here flip that upside down and come stay here you're, for five years <laughs> you're gonna laugh but one of the first weeks when we arrived here we went to the beach we have a beautiful beach right right in, next to us and it was a sunset purple sky beautiful sky and, and Megan was running into the water. And I said, well, can you do this again? I want to snap a photo of you running into the water. I took a photo. She posted it on Instagram. And the, the tourism office of the Dominican Republic picked it up as their photo of the day. <laughs> so I, I said, it's so funny because we just got here and we we're already advertising the country and the destination <laughs> to the world. So there you go. <laughs> they benefited from you showing up. See that? There it is. Remote workers, knowledge workers showing up and benefiting the country right away. There you go. That's, I love that's it. the spirit. <laughs> um, that's great. And uh, I also, so can you very quickly, like the 30 second each version, I'd love to hear you compare and contrast your typical routine day to day to day in New York versus today in the Dominican Republic. 
what does oh, a what God. does a day in the life of Bougainville <laughs> look like? Compare contrast. <laughs> so the biggest difference is that here we wake up earlier, but we don't have an alarm clock. Alarm mm. clocks stress me out. Me too. If you if I, I set that. an alarm for yeah for a flight or any other commitment, I can't sleep. And it, it's gotten only worse now because I'm not used to alarm clocks. We wake up about the same time, you know, somewhere between seven and eight anyway, without an alarm. In New York, I would you know, take a shower, get dressed, skip breakfast because I didn't have time, put on a suit and run. And the last commute we had, well, I had was taking a train, commuter train, then switching to a subway train and then walking a little bit to my office, which took me, if I did, if everything worked out, which not, was not always the case, was 45 minutes, which could turn easily to two hours if there was any hiccup with the trains. Two hours on the way back on a Friday, which I describe in the book, when you have dinner plans, it's not fun. Mm. I have to tell you that. So I was getting to an office, I was firing up my computer, you know, little small talk with, with my colleagues, and I was ready to work. So you can do the math. Um, when people say the commute is 45 minutes. No, the commute is probably two and a half, three hours between prepping, settling down, getting ready, <laughs> all, all, all in. It's, it's a process. It's like when you, when you go to the gym and you're like, yeah, I'm only there for 45 minutes. No, the workout was 45 minutes. You had to get there. You had to get changed. You had to shower. You had to stretch. You, you know, like it's, it's a two hour deal, you know, <laughs> it's, it's uh, yeah, there's all the, there's all the fluff around it. Exactly. Then I, I had two parts of the day, before lunch, after lunch, you know, meetings, calls. I, I used to have Zooms even from the office. So that's something that we were already transitioning to with a lot of clients anyway. But uh, we would have lunch in the office or sometimes I had the lunch outside. And my colleagues were better about keeping time in terms of lunch because if, if nobody told me it's lunchtime, I would miss lunch and uh, get really hungry and then run out and get something, which is not a healthy thing to do. And if the, the food that you can get quickly, it's not the best food for you, which you know, my body is very grateful that that's not the case anymore. Now, these days we are up and there's no alarm clock and uh, I uh, run to the beach and I go for a swim or I go surfing every single morning. If the conditions are good, I go surfing. If they're not so good, I just swim across the bay back and forth, which is a fun workout. Then I sit down, I meditate for a little bit I have my little notepad with me because I have all kinds of new ideas that come to me after that, that swim and a little bit of a quiet time for articles, writing. I write every week. I write an article, mostly investment related, although I sneak in some remote work. I call it propaganda in my articles. <laughs> <laughs> we so, secretly so then advertise. I'm we're, we're secretly <laughs> promoting. Yeah, I, I do this as well. <laughs> Secretly, secretly you know, promoting the, the, this lifestyle. And uh, then we have a, a full breakfast. We sit down. We actually have time together because there's no commute. We have a full breakfast every single day, which I didn't, didn't have in the past. It wasn't my routine. I didn't have the time for a breakfast. I would skip breakfast every morning. I, again, I don't think it's the healthiest thing to do. And after breakfast, we have some, some you know, I call it deep work. I have time to actually focus and, and write, read, respond to emails, do some research. I, I have to do a lot of reading for my work. And then we have lunch. And it's always about you know, the same time every day, unless we have some calls that, that we have to move things around. But we, we cook lunch at home. And we did it in the mountains. We are doing it here. And then we have a couple more hours. Now the, the schedule can change if the surf is really good or we feel like going for a walk like we did yesterday. Then we put everything on hold and we go for a two hour walk on the beach. The day is beautiful and we're gone. Or we would go kayaking or hiking in the mountains. So then if I need to, I'll make it up in the evening and, and you know, read something, write something later during the day. And uh, I try not to have too many commitments. So I never schedule two calls or two Zooms in a day. That, that I try to, because I, I want to make, you know, I want to completely give you full attention, like you and I today, this is the only thing I'm thinking about right now. And that's, that's how I want to treat every engagement of that kind with anybody. So I try not to have too many things in a day uh, of that nature, if possible. And I've been pretty successful, not initially when we transitioned, but right now, I think I am. And then uh, we go for a sunset walk or we, um, I go for another swim if it's a nice day. Then we cook dinner 
the cooking at home has been a big change and I talk about it extensively in the book. I feel like because we pick the food we eat, it, it really changed how we feel and our bodies responded and uh, we feel better. We, I think it's just a healthier choice than you know, grabbing a quick lunch in the city as convenient as it is. It's not a good long-term choice. Yeah. And then, you know, read, watch a show, go to bed and, uh, you know, start all over. But the day is flexible enough so that we can uh, sneak in as many fun things as we want. And you know, we, if we want to go whale watching, then I'm not available most of the day. And I'm, <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's, Do you, you have to reflect sometimes, right? Like on the fact, like it, when you compared those two, like in the, in the first scenario, the fluctuation was like if you make the train or not and everything goes correctly. Yeah. And like, and, and in that case, you know, best case scenario, the commute's 45 minutes and worst case scenario, maybe you're late for a meeting and all this, the gray hairs that that causes. But, uh-huh. but then on the flip side, like where you are now, it's like, well, if the surf's good, you know, I'll be surfing. And if, if the uh, watermelon's ripe, then I guess we're going to have watermelon. And, you know, if there's whales, yeah. we're going to go whale watching and like, and, and yet, yeah. Even so, I know yeah. this from the book, like your business continued to thrive, um, yeah. perhaps even did better, and you yeah. still incorporate this kind of lifestyle. You got rid of the stressful alarm clock, also something yeah. we have in common. I, I hate them. I, I got rid of mine as well. I, I do not wake up to an alarm <laughs> clock, and I still wake up early, and I still get my work done, so... Yeah, that's uh, that's so cool to hear. And and I, I this is there's a lot of this in the in the book again. But I just it's very it's very fun to to hear it from from uh, directly from the source. And um, the the last question I'm going to ask you, we we started here, and we didn't spend a lot of time here. But I'm I'm fascinated by this. You you talk about your start in Poland in in communist yeah. Poland at the time of your childhood. And mm-hmm. the dichotomy between where you started and where you are today as a successful mm-hmm. business op- owner in, in one of the um, most capitalist <laughs> societies in the world <laughs> and in the, in the finance industry at that, and uh, the, with the ability to do what you're doing, um, both in terms of life and like activities, you know, like, I mean, sailing and flying airplanes and and scuba diving and surfing like these are these are luxuries that obviously were not at your fingertips growing up in poland so if you want to expand expound on on that that uh kind of dichotomy that's great i was wondering if you could also share for me and for the audience like like if you have any particular story that sort of epitomizes what growing up in Poland at that time was like, because I bet a lot of people can't quite envision that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I wonder if you can expound upon that. I I love the question. So I feel like we all grew, you know, we grow up in different places and uh, I think it's very hard what I realize with uh, friends and clients and people we get to meet. It's, it's very hard to relate to other people's stories. And I, I accept that. And I understand it's very hard for people to see uh, the, the life that I lived. But it, doesn't, it shouldn't stop us from sharing it. But I think, you know, I, I have friends who escaped from Vietnam, ended up on an island, stranded for a year. And a friend that wrote a book uh, about it, uh, he, uh, you know, he spent a a year or two on an island as a child with his family stranded. And, you know, I was telling him stories of my growing up in Poland. I thought, I can't really relate to the life you lived. And I, I can tell that you can't relate to the life I lived, but it shaped us. And he, the last place he wants to go to is a tropical island. And me growing up in, you know, cold winter Poland uh, under communism with, you know, empty stores and grayness, which I couldn't really see as a child. I, you know, I was a happy child. I didn't really uh, see it. But I realized that once we, once I was able to leave and see the rest of the world, it's it's very hard to relate to the story. But just just to give people an idea, under communism, everything was owned by the government, so you couldn't get any other job other than a government job. So from a bakery to a hospital to a bank to schools uh, to the smallest supermarket, everything was owned by the government, and you couldn't be fired. And uh, everybody had to have a job. It was, you know, there was no choice. Yeah. 
or you could be retired or you could be in a mental institution. So, <laughs> not, not, uh, yeah. so, so when, when you think that your freedoms and your rights become your obligations and, and you, you know, enforcing you, it's a very different uh, reality. Now, because uh, there was no, no motivation to do a better job, it, you can move um, up the ladder in, in you know, terms of compensation. Actually, the compensation was tilted in a way that the more degrees you got, the more you studied, uh, the less money you made. And you definitely made less money than uh, somebody that had no education and was working in a well-respected, you know, dirty job in a coal mine. So wow. that was the mentality. So there was no motivation for you to go to school. And you know, my parents were doctors. I, and money was not the reason why they wanted. To, they had a calling to be doctors. So, mm. And people that had a calling to be teachers, uh, some of the, the family members were teachers. You would do what you wanted to do because that's, that was your calling. You wouldn't do it for the money because there was no um, monetary benefit from getting better at what you do and getting degrees or you know, being moving up in your career. Right. Now, the, the stores were, were empty, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't buy things. There was a, a gray or a, or a black market in things, so you could buy groceries directly from farmers. And the government kind of, uh, it was not endorsed or legal, but the, the government let it happen because the stores were so, the government-owned stores were so inefficient and empty and gray. And, and just, uh, it was a failing uh, experiment, a very quickly failing experiment in the 80s when I was growing up were kind of the last minutes of, of the complete failure of the experiment. And for me, the eye-opening thing was once they gave people freedom and it was the freedom to start a business, get a job, take risks, be an entrepreneur, the country changed completely. And the first entrepreneurs, when the borders opened because the country was closed, uh, would take their cars and they would drive to West Berlin because East, East Germany was as bad as Poland at the time. But they would drive to West Berlin, pack their trunks with uh, chocolates and, and juices and everything else, and drive this back to Poland and, and sell it. So these were the first entrepreneurs in Poland because you couldn't buy those things. So we had all the chocolates with, with you know, German names on it. Nussbeiser was one of the brands, I remember. <laughs> and we saw, oh, wow, they're, they're colorful things, and there are all kinds of products on the other side of the border. And, <laughs> and I think then, then you know, made me realize, <laughs> oh, there's a whole different world. And you know, my parents took me on a trip to, to Vienna, Austria, and it was an eye-opening experience that there's a whole colorful world out there with stores full of products and people are happier and people are you know, pursuing their dreams and lives. And you don't have to be a millionaire, but you have a very decent life. Now, you know, again, growing up in Poland, I didn't really see uh, the lack of things because as a child, you know, you're happy with little things. And I think I'm still happy with little things like the fruit stand in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> it's the little things. It's the little things. But Poland started to change and dramatically and uh, you know, stores started to open up, uh, the trade opened up. Investments opened up and the country was changing very quickly in the next few years. Uh, you know, there were all kinds of hiccups with the stock market going up and down, which was a great learning experience for me, not knowing yet that that's the, the you know, investment path I'll take. And you know, seeing hyperinflation, we're talking about inflation now in the US. I've seen hyperinflation in Poland when money lost 99% of its purchasing power in a matter of a you know, few years. Wow. And uh, it was you know, very disturbing. I remember going to the store and the price was different every time you went, not by a cent or two, but you know, zeros were added to the price. Hmm. You know, it was 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. And, and you realize, oh, you have to spend your money quickly because it's losing value. And people saw the dollar, dollars as a hard currency to put their savings in because the local currency was losing value. So I think all those experiences actually help me on the investment path when I talk to people my age and even anybody that has joined the investment profession since the 70s has not experienced inflation in the United States. Or actually, you know, Europe, a lot of Europe has not experienced inflation for many decades. And I have seen it. And it's very different to read about it and actually experiencing it. So I think it gives me a, you know, a secret advantage in my profession that I have seen a lot of things that other people have only read about. So I think in that way, I think it helped me in my career. But all this to say that 
it made me appreciate the, f the freedoms. If you were born with a lot of freedoms, you might not see them. And, you know, I, I know people who are much more deprived than I was and even, you know, less aware of the fact that they were deprived, like my friend from Vietnam. But just seeing how much freedom we're, we're given to move around, to choose a job they want, we want. My grandma in the 50s was, after being done with school, you were considering your remote options. I was considering... You know, should I choose more money or a job I really want to do? And my grandma gave, get, got an order to take a job that was hundreds of miles away from her home. And she was 20, you know, she was young. And it was a government order because they needed accountants in that part of Poland. And her dad stepped in and was able to change that order for her because people were given orders where they're needed. You know, you were basically, wow. you belonged to the, you, were, you belonged to the country, you you are not an individual making your own decisions about your life. You are taking orders from the top. Uh, and uh, that changed me. You know, my, my parents who were going to school in, in the 70s and early 80s. That wasn't the case anymore. But in the 50s, it was. Can you imagine somebody telling you, you have to take a job in, you know, wherever you don't want to go i don't know where it is in the in the world but <laughs> yeah <laughs> we won't name names but yeah there are places <laughs> there are places so and and that's the order and if you don't you know it's it's you know, it's a jail time attached to it if you don't follow through unless you can find a way to have somebody change that for you which is more of an exception than a rule and people were ordered to do things so Having those things and those stories and those experiences made me realize you know, how much freedom there is and how valuable that freedom is. Now, the last 12 months are peculiar because we kind of had a lot of our freedoms taken away from us for you know, safety and health reasons because of COVID. But think about it, you know, in terms of traveling around, when we were leaving New York, they were telling us that Pennsylvania doesn't want New Yorkers because New York had a very, you know, very high cases. And I was thinking, we're all Americans yeah, and we're not allowed to cross state lines. And it was spooky. Now I heard stories that at some point Georgia was not welcoming New Yorkers. Once we were in Georgia, New York put Georgia on the red list that we couldn't fly from Georgia to New York. We had to quarantine. So, wow. I mean, uh, these are small things, but they're big things like big, 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 you know, freedoms that are being taken away from us. For you know valid reasons, uh, I still believe, but I hope that they go away quickly, and and they are in some cases. I, I think some parts of the world have more. You know, Poland right now is going through a lot of lockdowns. I talk to my family every day, and they're going through another wave of COVID, and uh, they have even more restrictions now than they had earlier. So I hope that those things go away. But I think we all had a flavor. Even my American friends had a flavor of stores with uh, empty shelves for a brief mm -hmm. period of time but still lines outside of stores because of COVID and then not being able to to move around the way we are used to and uh, you know that's it's kind of I don't want to say wake up call but uh, you know just let's let's appreciate the freedoms we have because they might be taken away and hopefully it's you know it's a short-lived uh, pickup in our freedoms but it's all those things that you don't see until you want to do something and you're told you can't. Yeah. That, I think you used the, used the phrase wake up call. And I feel like that's so well said. I think, uh, we, we take a lot of things for granted. And I mean, I even try to be careful on this show. I'm talking with a lot of people like, like you and I, who are so privileged to be able to not just have the ability to choose where we want to live and to do some of these really, you know, fun and, and, and live where others vacation kind of things, but also to li literally be able to have choice and exactly. not just for your job or, f but like, I mean, talking to one, one friend here from Venezuela who mm -hmm. is a, is a, is an exile and yeah. can't go literally said to us at one point, you know, oh, that's really nice. You can go back. Like we were maybe complaining about, you know, oh, we haven't seen our family in a year or something. So oh, that's really nice. You can go back home. Like I'll never be back in my country. I can never go back to my country, you know, and just, and, and so, you know, you've had your experiences and like you said, you know, people that have had, had it so mm -hmm. even, even tougher. And, and so I think it's really important, like 
one of the things I want to shed light on on this show is like, yeah, it's amazing all the opportunity that we have available to us. But like part of that is having that available to you. Like it would be a real shame to waste it because there are so many people that would would kill for even a, a percentage of that opportunity for choice. And it's it's not available to everybody. And so it's important to keep that perspective. Well, historically, the last few decades, the world has become more free, which yeah. you know, I'm very grateful for. And it's it's been the case for more and more parts of the world. Uh, the book that I mentioned, I just looked it up. I, I forgot it was called My Deserted Island by Victor Huang, the, the friend that I told you about. If anybody's interested, it's a fantastic book. And he shares his story of uh, escaping from Vietnam and staying stranded uh, on an island and also escaping from communism, by the way. I mean, you think about all the people that were exposed to communism and had to run away from communism. You know, Venezuela is no exception. It, it's also a, a, com- a country that's aspiring to be a communist state, but it kind of gives you an idea of what that experiment has done to so many people. And here in DR, we met people from Venezuela, like the person you mentioned, that mentioned, that are uh, in exile. They left Venezuela and they can't go back. So it's still the case, but uh, you know, the trend has been the world is more free, except for the last 12 month hiccup that is more of a health reason rather than a political reason why we can't move around. But it is pretty scary to see some freedoms being taken away from you. And uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it is a wake up call. You know, let's let's appreciate the things we can do when we can do them. And I hope that in a matter of months or maybe you know, a year, we have all our freedoms back and we can all move around, see our families and friends and continue our remote existence without keeping the COVID restrictions in mind. You know, we had here curfews and bans and all those things. And we accept it because it's just for now. That kind of makes you think uh, just the freedom to leave your house can be taken away from you. So yeah, something to think about. Definitely is. Thank you for for diving into that for us and and shedding some light on that chapter of your life. It's it's very, I hate to use the word interesting because I, I know there were challenges there, but it is it's good for people to have that that perspective and um and I think also just again super cool to see uh, the the journey that your life has become and and the path that you've followed and where you are today is is super interesting. So anyway, uh, I I had a blast today. Uh, getting to know you Me better, too. learning yes. more about the story, and um, I'm sure people listening did as well. It's it's a uh, it's a great book, and I'm I'm hopeful people will go and read it. Are there any other? We'll, we'll link to that in the show notes, by the way, for everybody listening, so you can go to the show notes and click directly on the link to buy the book. Are there any other websites or social handles or anything that people should find you on? You can mention them here, and we'll again list them in the show notes. So the book is Living Where Others Vacation. It's available on Amazon as a Kindle and a paperback. Uh, you can look me up and, uh, you know, my, my name is Bogomil Baranowski. I'm sure it will be in your notes, but uh, bogomilbaranowski.com is my website where I post a lot of content. I'm also available on Twitter and I post less, but you can find me on Twitter and to be honest with you, I have to look up my Twitter handle to make sure. I, right. <laughs> I would be in that boat as well. I'm a bad Twitter citizen. <laughs> well, now and then I post. So if, if you just Google my name on Twitter, you'll find me Bogomil Baranowski, but it's at Bogomil, the, the under, um, whatever it's called, under, 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 what's it called? Underscore, underscore NYC. It's still NYC. So it's Bogomil underscore NYC. On Excellent. Twitter, Bogomil Baranowski, where, where I post uh, now and then, not a lot, but uh, whenever I have something on my mind, I share. <laughs> but it was well, it was a great pleasure, a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it, and I hope that our story and our conversation can be an inspiration for uh, you know, young and the old and the curious at any stages of their discovery of you know, different lifestyles, and, and it can inspire them to pursue their dreams and give them a little bit of courage and direction as well. I hope so as well. And I, I think it's probably going to be the case. So yeah, again, thank you for sharing and, and for coming by. And I, I find it funny, like, like this is, um, there's so much information that we got to here and one 
giant piece that we didn't even touch on at all is the fact that you immigrated to America and like you have, I believe you have an American (laughs) passport and like, I I mean, this could have been, this could be a Joe Rogan style, you know, four hour long, uh, interview, but we, um, we know, we know you've got things to do, so I'll, I'll let you go, but thank you again, Bogomil. This was awesome. I had a blast and, um, I, uh, I look forward to continuing to follow the journey. Amazing. Thank you again. It was nice to meet you. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. You can visit aboutabroad.com to get our latest updates and listen to past episodes, or find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, really anywhere you get your podcasts. On that note, if you enjoyed the show, feel free to subscribe and if inclined, leave a few stars and a review. It's truly, truly appreciated and will help more wanderers just like you find us. Until the next time, adios from España.